so I, I think uh, I want to start with the discussion of uh, discussion of equilibrium, because what this uh, example is illustrating is the new consideration that we need to start giving. So, as a reminder, um, as a kind of way to um, recap what we've been doing so far, we've been doing force analysis. I mean, you know, before. Um, <laughs> before introducing energy and momentum and other more um, easier problem solving methods, what we introduced and spent a lot of time with is a force analysis. Like this box just sitting on the ground right now, it's a, such a simple setup that you might say nothing is going on here. But um, with our force analysis technique, we can say more than that. We can say, oh, it's not nothing going on. There are two forces acting on this box. There's gravity pulling it down, and there's normal force pushing it up. And they simply happen to add up in such a way their net force is equal to zero. Okay. We can say that. And... Um, and yeah, it that that's right. Um, it's and we can also do this uh, force analysis as we change the setup a little bit. This that's the power of the standard strategy that it is versatile. Let's say you are applying some downward force, then still nothing happens. But in terms of forces, you can describe it as oh, there's a downward applied force. So with this change, actually, your upward normal force has to change because that's the constraint for the normal force that it prevents things from digging in. So, um, so that's how the net force is still equal to zero. And let me just do a couple more things. Uh, I could lift this up. And as I try to lift it up, up to some point, like it's still on the ground. So as I apply an upward force, um, what should be happening as I try to apply upward force? What should be happening is normal force is decreasing and decreasing. Now, at some point, normal force decreases to a point where, oh wait, I'm not running the simulation. <laughs> normal force decreases to a, okay, as, oh yeah. So, sorry, let me redo this. So, so pushing it down, that was the previous picture. <laughs> and as I push it up, now, I guess this is light enough that it always does that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, let me make it heavier so that I can have a little more fun. Uh, maybe this much, yeah. So as I apply an upward force, ah, oh, it's, why is it so light? It's not light, but I guess um, um, there might be some kind of uh, thing. Yeah, I, I guess the dragging force is um, I can apply a fixed amount of force. All right, that's fine. Um, so, so yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so this is the uh, uh, this is. Uh, static equilibrium that we have uh, seen so far. And as we do this analysis, um, so right now I have the settings set so that we say drag a center of mass. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's actually how we've been treating things, even though we haven't uh, mentioned that explicitly. Like, let me disable this. And with this disabled, I can actually pull this, you know, to the left, to the right. And as I do that, you know, if I'm describing its acceleration in the horizontal direction, then I would basically draw this same diagram still. Like I would draw my, um, I would uh, draw my, uh, let's say, rightward apply the force and leftward the friction force. And um, and this is how we are used to drawing free body diagram uh, as the forces on a dot that represents the object. And, and um, we are going to have to modify that a little bit as we start going into rigid body motion that includes rotation. So before, I think when we briefly mentioned static equilibrium, this is what we said. 
So before we for describing a static equilibrium condition, we've said when a net force is equal to zero, then we have static equilibrium. And that worked really well for situation like this. And it described how as I push this down, it doesn't um, move because the net force has up to zero. And as I pull it up at some point, it um, starts to move up and the net force is in zero. And as I move it left to and right, I think if I pull it at exactly the right force, I could make it move at constant speed. That would describe when the applied force is equal to the friction force or the net force is equal to zero. So with that picture in mind, this is what I want to explore. To show that um, simply saying net force is equal to zero starts to run into some limitations. This is, is the ladder on a wall example. It's a classic example for illustrating when um, il illustrating the considerations that go into as you analyze more complicated static equilibrium situation. So let me pause this for a bit. Uh, I want to set this up. Well, okay, so something like um, this maybe. Okay, let me just move it here and I'm just gonna gently set it down. Hopefully nothing happens. Gently set it down, okay, there it is. So as we look at this ladder, uh, if uh, someone asks, so you can clearly observe that the acceleration here is zero. And if uh, someone asks you, why is the acceleration zero? You might do this um, almost uh, as a second nature now. You would describe a free body, you, you would draw a free body diagram um, of this mass. There's gonna be a downward uh, uh, gravity, uh, force of gravity. And this uh, downward force of gravity, ah, I see a point of contact here, normal force. So this normal force, will oppose the downward force of gravity. So they balance out to zero net force. This is zero net force leads to zero acceleration. That would be an easy way to describe this. And, um, and I think if you're just looking at this picture, um, unless you spend the right amount of time looking at it, you don't really see a contradiction here. We expected the zero net force, zero acceleration, zero movement, that's what we get. There's no reason to question anything, so we move on. That's really easy to do. So I want to give you something that um, hopefully will make you think a little more, uh, at least the puzzle a little bit, because it looks uh, a little bit contradictory. So let me, uh, did I pause the simulation already? Oh wait, I did run <laughs> the simulation, sorry. When I don't expect anything to happen, sometimes I forget. Okay, so let me stop the simulation for a bit. And then I'm going to move this bar in such a way that, um, that it'll start to move when I run the simulation. So I need to move this out a little bit and I need to rotate it a little more. Maybe something like this. I think this is a good angle. We'll give it a try. So I'm going to set it gingerly here. And before I set it down, let me do this. I'm going to move all these diagrams over. And before I start the simulation again, I'm just gonna ask myself this question. Has anything in my free body diagram changed? Do I need to change anything? Has gravity changed? It's the same ladder, it doesn't, I don't think it would have changed. Has the normal force changed? Maybe, but um, I mean, the point of contact is still same, so let's leave it alone for now. So before I start running the simulation, I might be excused for thinking, um, well, net force is still gonna be zero and acceleration will be zero. Let's run the simulation and see. Yeah, it falls down. Oh, maybe I did something wrong. That's uh, okay. Maybe it bounced a little too much there. So I'm gonna move it down. Let it not bounce so much. Let's try it again. Still slight. So something has uh, definitely changed. And now, 
What's challenging with the, our old way of force analysis is I, I don't quite see what I can change to account for that difference between two angles at which the ladder was leaning. Somehow at one angle, it was leaning fine, it wasn't moving, and at another angle, now it slides. So this is where I have to start modifying our previous approach. So one of the things I need to modify is how I draw my free body diagram. So I am used to drawing my free body diagram on a dot because that's the simplest way I can represent my object and illustrate all the forces. Turns out that uh, uh, that's not going to work anymore, <laughs> at least for situations like this. So we need to start extending our um, extending the, the points at which we draw our forces so that we can more correctly represent the reality. So I need to have an extended length on which I can illustrate forces better. Now here, gravity, uh, thankfully, don't really have to change. Now, uh, in the real picture, this is not how gravity works. Gravity works on every little portion of this bar. So there's a kind of distributed pull um, over the entire length of the ladder. But this is something special about gravity and center of mass that for analysis like this, all these distributed forces of gravity, I can pretend that they are acting at a single point here, the center of mass. And when I do that, the calculation result will work out and it'll still be exactly correct. So I'm going to go with the convention and say, my gravity acts at this center of mass with some value um, um, mg. That, um, that's what my gravity is going to be. So my gravity doesn't change. Now, as you can see here, the normal force will have to change because where I've drawn the normal force, that's not where the, uh, that's not where the point of contact is. And the, the point <laughs> of drawing this extended body is so that we can draw these forces where they act. And this normal force, it at this end point, or you know, it acts here. But if I'm drawing it on this line, I have to say it acts here at the end point. This is my normal force. And I hope as you look at this diagram, you can notice that something is now different. That's the that's the um, advantage or the point of this graphical problem solving tool of the free body diagram, is it. Um, it helps you visualize. It helps you see, huh, something has changed. So before, when I had my force and normal force directly opposing each other, it was easy to believe that the net force would be zero and acceleration would be zero. Now, as I look at these two forces, I hope you can visualize those two arrows, one down and one up as saying, hmm, those two don't look like they will add up to net zero motion. Uh, if they kind of look like they will be going in circles like this. And this is where you have to start considering torque. We introduced the torque uh, as we were talking about rigid body rotation. And this is the second condition that we need to add. So uh, for the static equilibrium condition, when something is at static equilibrium, not only is the net force equal to zero, we say that the net torque is equal to zero. It's a vector quantity and all this stuff. So, so that's what we need to work through. I, I think um, um, so for this picture, we talked a little bit about defining a uh, center of rotation and I think uh, I might have even mentioned that when you have a static equilibrium condition, more specifically net force equal to zero, then you have a free choice of picking a center of rotation. You can, uh, so you could have picked this as your center of rotation, this as your center of rotation, this as your center of rotation, and it would all work out as long as you're consistent. Um, 
let me just be a little bit careful here, even though I probably could do that. Um, so in the general situation where your net force maybe isn't equal to zero, the one choice of center of rotation that'll always work, as long as you go through steps properly, is the center of rotation that is at the center of mass. So let me use this point as my reference point for as I'm calculating the contribution to torque. So when we are looking at this free body diagram before, we are looking at it and saying, hey, we got everything we need. No more forces needed. Now let's see if that's still true. So, um, so we have gravitational force, which is providing zero torque. That's fine because the lever arm is zero. And we have the normal force. It has a non-zero lever arm or you know, go through the proper steps, line of action, distance from center of rotation to perpendicular distance from the center of rotation to the line of action. That's the lever arm. So it is non-zero lever arm. And with that lever arm, you see that this is causing counterclockwise rotation. So, so far, as I'm tracking my net torque, I'm saying, oh, it's counterclockwise, and I can't have that. If I'm hoping to have static equilibrium, no motion, then I need a net torque of zero. So this is what tips me first, that I'm missing some force. So I look, stare at the picture a little bit more, trying to find that missing force, and I eventually realize, oh, yeah, silly me. I have a point of contact here. So there must have been a normal force there before that I didn't realize before that I needed. So let me draw that normal force, make this free body diagram complete. So I'm going to draw, so you know, the force is acting here, but I'm gonna draw it at this point because I'm still trying to draw my diagram as simply as possible. So this is going to be normal force from the wall. Now, each time you, um, you draw a force, you have to ask yourself this, this question. Are my static equilibrium conditions met? Is my, is the diagram consistent with my net force being zero and net torque being zero? And you may think, hey, my net force was already zero, but as you draw more forces, that could change. So you should always check it again. So as I check it again, yeah, I have, so, the vertical forces, I can imagine they would add up to zero. So I have no problem there. The problem comes in with my horizontal forces. With this new normal force, normal uh, the rightward force, I need a leftward force to counter it. And this is where you do look through the hum. Where can I get a leftward force? And as you look, you realize, oh, uh, here it is. At my point of contact here, uh, I drew a normal force and that gave me what I needed, so I ended it there. But in a more general situation, that's not the end of the story for a contact force. There could be a friction force here. And in fact, the friction force at this point would be basically the only thing that can provide a leftward force. So let me draw that. I'm probably going to have a leftward friction force, a static friction force at this point. And if these forces are equal somehow, then I can make it so that the net force will add up to zero. And now check if I can make the net torque equal to zero. So I have this normal force that's uh, tending to produce counterclockwise torque, but I have this normal front force from the wall tending to produce clockwise torque. Okay, do I have any other forces that provide? Ah, there it is, the friction force here. This is the lever arm for the friction force. Uh, extend this into a line of action, and it's the perpendicular distance from the center of rotation. So this uh, friction force will also provide a torque that's uh, uh, clockwise. So the, this uh, torque will add up to the torque due to the normal force. So at this point is where I do have enough in my diagram to explain why, um, what if this uh, normal force from the wall is much larger or is larger than the maximum value that the friction force can be. 
the maximum or the the maximum value static friction force can be is um, mu times n. So if uh, this normal force is somehow exceeding that value, that would explain why we are seeing this. So if that's true, then I should be able to make this stay by increasing the friction coefficient. Let me see if I can do that. I have a friction here, right now 0 0.5. Let me see, uh, let's see what we get if this is a one. Just for kicks. Um, uh, oh, it stays. Wait, is it staying? It's ever so slightly sliding. Okay, I, I think. So at one, it was right at the threshold. So if I make this two, then I think we can make it stay or one point whatever. Okay, let me run it again. And yeah, it's, not, well, I guess maybe before it was also eight. Yeah, oh. so, so yeah, this is a, uh, um, so so this is the ladder on a, on wall example. I, I think uh, when um, at the beginning of the semester I said this that we ignore friction whenever we can. We um, so we try to neglect friction whenever we can, and with rigid body rotation and static equilibria, we now get this these situations where what you see physically um, requires there to be friction for you to reconcile what you see with this uh, picture of the force analysis. So if you have a zero friction, then I, I think here it's kind of easy to imagine with the zero friction, here it'll slide. I mean, it was already sliding before with uh, not zero friction, but with a friction of 0 0.5. But let me demonstrate just how important this friction is to maintaining the static equilibrium that you saw before. So going back to our original picture at the beginning of this discussion, let's say um, the ladder is uh, leaning on the wall at a fairly comfortable angle so that, uh, because you know, this picture actually does look a bit uh, precarious. Like I can just imagine it sliding even before I start running the simulation. So let's not do that. Let's say, okay, we're gonna move this up rotate it up so that it's at a, some reasonable angle and lean it against the wall again. And you can see, all right, that's leaning comfortably. Now, let me get rid of friction in this setup and see what happens. So I'm going to get rid of friction and it's light. And the reason it slides is, all right, I lost it. Reason it slides is, if we do the same analysis as before, then what we would say is, oh, as I'm looking at this ladder on the wall, there's gravity pulling it down. And uh, um, if you were to use this as your uh, point of um, uh, center of rotation, then this gravitational force, it's causing counterclockwise torque. So, and you know, I do have normal force at this point, but the normal force doesn't, at the center of rotation, it doesn't have any lever arm. So I need additional forces to oppose this counterclockwise torque. And that'll come from this normal force from the wall that'll produce clockwise torque. Now with this normal force from the wall, you need something that'll produce a left toward the force. And usually, it would be the friction force at this point. But if you change the setup so that this thing has no friction coefficient, then it'll slide. So, so this is the ladder on a wall example. And uh, it's a classic example. I do have some questions that you can work through. It actually relates to, you know, safety. If you are working on, I don't know, painting the house, going up on the roof of the house, you should <laughs> know that um, if the ladder seems as secure as you stand on the bottom, it's not necessarily the case that it'll remain secure as you climb to the top. So uh, there's a separate video of me working out the scenario. So take a look at that. And this is the presentation of that ladder on a wall um, example.